Hello, my name is Travis Monk. This is one of a series of videos introducing biology, the study of life. This video will provide an overview of graphing, how to properly present data visually. As the picture at the top of this slide shows, there are a tremendous number of different ways to present data visually. This video will describe a few of the most important types of graphs, when they should be used, as well as some general graphing guidelines. The purpose of a graph is to exhibit data and trends in data and to do so in a way that is easy for others to understand and interpret. There are many guidelines that will be discussed in detail on the next few slides. The picture to the right is the antithesis of what a graph should look like. There's no description of what the graph shows, there are no labels, and some of the data is not visible and it's very intimidating or confusing to look at. There are a host of requirements to properly graph a set of data. First, every graph should have a scientific title. The scientific title should include the independent and dependent variable for the experiment and should thoroughly describe what occurred in an experiment. The format, the effect of IV or independent variable on DV or dependent variable usually works quite well. In the graph to the right, work experience would be the manipulated or independent variable while the measured value or dependent variable would be income. Second, every axis needs labels. With an appropriate title and labeled axes, the data can be interpreted by others quite easily. Attaching units such as experience in years or income in thousands is very important. Your graph does not need to start at the data points 0, 0. You can begin at any values on your x and y axis that you'd like. By starting at different values, for example, 15 years of experience or an income of $50,000, you can effectively zoom in or out of an area of interest, which is fine. Once you begin plotting data points, however, your intervals need to be consistent. If you added squiggly lines to jump significantly in terms of numbers, it might misrepresent your data. On the y-axis of this graphic, the intervals start at $5,000. Grid lines on this graphic are at $30,000, and $40,000. Each of these are 5000 apart. For some unknown reason, the data then jumps from $40,000 to $50,000, a jump of $10,000. Uh, this is not acceptable to do while you're graphing as it misrepresents the data. The last two requirements, putting the right variables on the right axis as well as choosing the right type of graph, will be explained in the next few slides. I have chosen graphs that do not fulfill some of these requirements for graphing, such as the one on this slide involving intervals, to exhibit why it is so important to follow these guidelines. One important concept for graphing that was mentioned on the previous slide is that the correct variables need to go on the correct axes. The independent variable, which is the intentionally changed variable by the experimenter, should go on the x-axis or the horizontal axis. The dependent variable, which is measuring the changes in response to the independent variable, should be found on the y-axis or the vertical axis. Oftentimes you can use your independent variable to determine what type of graph is most appropriate for use. This will be described in the next few slides as a few common graphs are introduced. The graphic on the right was chosen because it exhibits where the independent and dependent variables should go. The graphic on the right, however, is missing a number of very important components that were mentioned on the previous slides. First, there is no title at all in this graphic, and it certainly is not a scientific title. Second, it does not have labeled axes of any sorts, uh, so this is a, another suggestion of what not to do when graphing. While it may not seem like it would be a challenge, choosing the right type of graph can actually be quite difficult to do. A pie graph, or a pie chart, is an example of a type of graph that you're probably more familiar with. It doesn't fit in well with the others because it doesn't have an X and a Y axis, as most graphs do. Pie charts are great for showing percentages or parts of a whole. The graph to the right is missing one of the requirements for a graph, which is a scientific title. I hope that the missing scientific title would highlight the importance of a quality title in describing uh, to others what they are looking at right away. An appropriate title for this graphic might have been the favorite movie genres of high school students. A scatter plot and line graph are best used when comparing an independent and dependent variable that are both numbers. Both a line graph and a scatter plot graph clearly show the relationship of one variable on another. Most frequently, line graphs have something to do with time. Individual dots are connected in line graphs while that is not the case with scatter plot graphs as exhibited to the right. The graphic to the right shows the relationship between money spent on health care and the average life expectancy for a newborn child. 
Since healthcare costs can range anywhere between the values marked on the x-axis, a scatterplot graph is most appropriate in this circumstance. While this scatterplot graphic does not have a line of best fit, which shows the pattern that occurs within the data set, it could very easily be added. The only problem that I find with this graphic is that the dependent variable, life expectancy at birth, is not at all referenced in the title, as it should be. The effect of healthcare expenditure on life expectancy at birth would have been a more appropriate title. A bar graph or a column graph is the right tool to use when comparing different things as opposed to just different numeric values. As the title on the graphic to the right suggests, this graphic shows the favorite sports of students. Since the title contains the independent variable, different sports, and references the dependent variable by describing students, it does a decent job of describing what the reader should find here. The one thing that this graphic is missing is a label for the X or horizontal axis, but otherwise it does a great job following the guidelines for graphing. If the dependent variable for this graphic, the number of students, had started at 10 as opposed to 0 to zoom in on the data in this graphic, that would have been absolutely fine. A box and whisker graph seems to be a lesser known type of graphic. The box and whisker graph looks a little bit more complicated than a scatter plot dot or a bar graph because it provides considerably more information. The box of the box and whisker graph shows three different things. First, it shows the median or the middle number of a set of data. This is expressed by the white line that separates the top and bottom halves of the box. At the top of the box is the second piece of information labeled here as the upper quartile. Everything above the box is in the top 25% of all data points. The very bottom of the box is labeled as the lower quartile. This is the third data point shown by the box. Every data point below the bottom of the box would represent the smallest 25% of the values from this particular data set. The whiskers of a box and whisker graph show another three pieces of information. First, there are outliers. Outliers are data points that statistically don't fit in with the rest of the data set. Outliers are shown at the very top and bottom of this graphic, and they are represented by dots. Second and third are the maximum and minimum values of a data set. These would be the largest and smallest numbers uh, from the data set, respectively, excluding outlying data points. Here is a box and whisker graph in its entirety. Again, the value of this type of plot is that the average data is represented in addition to the typical range and extreme data points. The graph certainly looks a lot more complex, but it can provide a lot more information. While a bar graph would show that the average temperature in July is about 22 degrees Celsius, a box and whisker graph shows that typical temperature ranges are from 18 to 25 degrees Celsius, and then in extreme cases, it has been as high as around 27 degrees Celsius. This graphic exhibits all the proper components of graphing. It contains a scientific title, label for axes, and it has proper intervals. The only information missing is the temperature units, degrees in Celsius. The information from this video is just a general set of guidelines that you should follow to more accurately and clearly depict your data. There may be exceptions or alternative options for some different graphing examples. That is the end of this video summarizing graphing types and graphing guidelines. If you're interested in learning about any specific biology concepts, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you.